Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Accelerate webinar series hosted by the University of Denver's Daniels College of Business Executive Education Program. I'm David Worley, Executive Director, and I'll be your host. This series is designed to help you accelerate your capacity to deliver results for your organization. The webinar is pre-recorded, but the faculty is still available to answer your questions live today as this episode airs. You can ask your question at any time throughout the session via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. For decades, most business professionals barely knew what supply chain meant. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, the relevancy of the technical discipline, which is supply chain management, became abundantly clear. What stood out to me in the middle of that period it was just how fragile our businesses and whole economy are due to being tied to antiquated supply lines throughout the world. It's within that context that we are excited to invite Jenny Dobmeyer to talk about tips for building resilience into supply lines. Jenny is a fantastic executive education faculty member, bringing her rich experience to teaching a variety of subjects for us in executive education. Additionally, Jenny teaches in the regular MBA programs around supply chain and also a variety of marketing and leadership topics. Jenny has had a distinguished 18-year career with Johns Manville, where she started as a research engineer, worked in supply chain and product development, led in a variety of different positions, culminating as the global manager for global filtration, and later as a marketing director. For the past seven years, she has also run her own consulting business, helping people be more effective leaders through holistic well-being. We are excited to hear from you, Jenny, and look forward to your presentation. I'm really excited, David, to talk about this super relevant topic in today's uncertain world on supply chain risk management. As we all know, the enormous impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the key role that supply chain risk management plays in achieving business goals, maintaining competitiveness, and also just survival in the new normal. So how can supply chains plan for the future? What I wanna get into today is how can you adapt to today's rapidly changing conditions, respond quicker, and demonstrate this value to your customers? Before I get into those risk management strategies, I first wanna point out and recognize that we had supply chain disruptions before the pandemic. We were not immune to exposure to supply chain vulnerabilities before. They just happened to be fewer and further in between so that customers and us as uh, consumers didn't recognize them as much. However, some research done by the McKinsey Global Institute pre-pandemic showed that companies had disruptions every 3.7 years on average that lasted about one to two months. Now, even though they were fewer and further between, they still had a significant financial impact on the companies experiencing them. This research showed that supply chain disruptions cost the average organization about half of one year's profit over the course of a decade. So they've always had a significant impact on companies, and maybe we as consumers hadn't yet felt it. But now that we are living in this post-pandemic world, let's talk about how disruptions happen and why we need to rethink how we manage our supply chains in times of volatility and uncertainty. And I'm going to start with the supply chain risk equation. And supply chain risk starts with vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities in a supply chain have existed because traditional supply chains sought to achieve stability and also minimized costs. So they were rigidly focused on reducing costs and increasing asset utilization so that what we had was minimal inventories. Companies, because the market was really good and disruptions were few and far between, maybe ended up being single sourced, having just one supplier for a key component or raw material. And also because the market has been so good over the last decade or so, and technology advancements have been happening so rapidly, and consumers have asked for customization in their products, some companies have ended up with an overly complex product portfolio. All of these vulnerabilities existed in supply chain before, but when the market was good, the water level was higher, and you might not have noticed these vulnerabilities as a consumer or a business owner. 
But when you couple those vulnerabilities with an unexpected event, say like a natural disaster, these disruptions in your supply chain can expose that vulnerability and lead to supply chain risk. And what that means is significant disruption to a company's operations as well as financial upset within the company and consumers feel the pain. Now, usually natural disasters are short-lived. They're acute, companies recover over a short period of time. The other thing about natural disasters is they're usually localized to one part of the country or one part of the world. What we know now with the COVID-19 pandemic is it affected us globally and global supply chain vulnerabilities were exposed. Because the pandemic disruption was so extended, companies did not have time to recover before consumers experienced significant issues. And these unexpected events can really cause significant financial disruption to your company. So how do we mitigate risk, knowing what we know now? And what I'm going to suggest is that companies think about redesigning their supply chain around new priorities or investing more time in these priorities, resilience, agility, and some ways to measure some key performance indicators to measure your supply chain risk exposure. These are not new concepts, but really thinking about investing time in the strategies that I'm gonna give you today and using these alongside your traditional objectives of cost, quality, and service. So let's dive in, starting with resilience. Supply chain resilience is a company's ability to navigate unexpected supply chain disruption with its existing capabilities. So in other words, the ability to react to problems and recover from them without significant impact to your operations and your financial bottom line, as well as not affecting your customers. So the ability to react and be resilient requires an awareness though. And this is some interesting research. Few organizations understand anything beyond their direct suppliers. So in 2021, McKinsey surveyed senior supply chain executives and just under half actually understood the location and key risks facing their immediate suppliers, their tier one suppliers. The really surprising thing is only 2% of those executives could make the same claim about steps further back in their supply chain, their tier three and their tier four suppliers. This matters because most disruptions originate in these deeper supply chain tiers. So how can your company start building resilience into your supply chain? Resilience starts with understanding your supply chain vulnerabilities which suppliers and facilities present potential points of risk or failure. A lot of companies, like I said, only have visibility back one step in their supply chain, one step back and one step forward. And really resilience is built when you map your entire supply network end to end, understanding each step, investigate the sourcing of each product, each raw material going back in the supply chain. What are the relationships? What are the dependencies? Even what are the modes of transportation that move your raw materials to those deeper tiers in your supply chain? And then identify those nodes of vulnerabilities. When you do this, this gives you visibility to something when it's going wrong so that you have an early warning system and you can do something about it. So once you have done that, once you have built your supply map, your supply network map and understand the, those points of uh, vulnerability, what can you do to mitigate your risk and build resilience? The first recommendation I'm gonna have is carrying inventory where you've identified those risks. Typically, our supply chains have reduced inventory down to a really lean level because it reduces the cash that we have tied up in inventory. And now that we know the impact of being exposed to a supply chain disruption, you really need to balance the cost to carry your inventory versus the cost of a supply chain disruption. What profit is at risk if you cannot meet supply your customers' orders? That's what you wanna balance and carry inventory where you have critical products and critical components that are at risk. The second suggestion I'm going to have is to qualify alternate sources 
If you have identified a situation where you have a single source, say for a raw material to your manufacturing plant, reduce dependency upon one source and one location by qualifying alternate sources. You can also mitigate your risk by locating warehouses near your location or near your key markets for your customers. And the last one on resilience that I'm going to talk about is building diversity in your modes of transportation. We have now understood the impact of delays at ports um, when you're shipping overseas. We know that we have issues with rail disruptions and a truck driver shortage. All of these modes of transportation are at, can create risk for your supply chain. So building diversity into if you are reliant on a rail line to get your raw material to your manufacturing plant, thinking about qualifying or under, getting some contracts with some trucking companies so that you have diversity in your modes of transportation is really going to mitigate your risk. All of these risk mitigation strategies need to be considered within your financial model. They might have some cost associated with them, but really risk mitigation in supply chain means that you balance, you understand your risk and you balance that cost versus what, can I, what is my opportunity lost if I missed customer sales and do not get the profit. So let's move on to agility. So being able to anticipate and respond rapidly to changing conditions are characteristics of an agile supply chain. And an agile supply chain may require a little bit of a change in our strategy and also some new tools and capabilities. And what I mean by a change in strategy is, let's look at some data on how companies were rigidly focused on lowering costs, reducing inventories, and also increasing asset utilization. All of those moves that help reduce cost, also decrease your ability to be agile. So to make this point clear, this is, I'm showing now some data from the US Census Bureau. It is showing the inventory versus sales over the course of the last three decades for retail and manufacturing industries. And as you can see, we have been on declining our inventory that we are carrying year over year down to a pretty significantly low level right before the pandemic. And the data that makes up this graph that the US Census Bureau reported, that companies had less than 45 days of sales in inventory when the pandemic began. Now that might have been a good inventory level when we were thinking about supply chain disruptions like natural disasters, which are typically short-lived and don't get experienced by the entire globe all at the same time. But what we know now is all supply chain disruptions are not short-lived. And we know that some of these crises can happen one right after another, like the Suez Canal Jam and the war on Ukraine, all of which have disrupted our supply chains. And it has shown that perhaps we're running too lean. And so to be agile, supply chain teams need to work in a much more proactive way, looking at the bigger picture. So let's talk about some agility strategies. The first that I'm going to recommend for creating an agile supply chain is the use of advanced techniques for demand planning and forecasting. And so smart automation, machine learning, these are all technologies that are becoming essential in supply chain risk management because they can find patterns and relationships and causality in the thousands and thousands and thousands of data points that we have available today. And they can do it faster and more accurately than our traditional analysis techniques. Another agility strategy in manufacturing could be to reevaluate your make versus buy decisions. So typically, manufacturers have kept production of stable, high volume products in-house, and they outsource these niche and specialty products. The thought process here is if you inverted that trend and you outsourced your high volume products to a cost advantaged external provider and kept your specialty products, your niche products in-house and invested in flexible core assets, 
that would allow you to respond more quickly and rapidly to changing markets, that might be a strategy that's going to work for you in uncertain times. Again, every business is going to have to assess these suggestions on whether it'll work for them or not, but that's something that manufacturing companies might want to look at. The last one I have here is regarding logistics. A greater use of third-party logistics providers can be a cost-effective way to increase your flexibility and your proximity to your customers. And I spoke about this a little bit in resilience as well. So those are the suggestions for mitigating risk and building agility into your supply chain. But I have one more on, agi on agility, and it's about your company and your people. Agile supply chains need skilled and flexible people working across functions to make optimal decisions. And so people need to be comfortable working with and alongside advanced technologies and with data analytics. So companies should think about training their current personnel and hiring for these wider range of skills so employees can move between tasks, work together, seeing the big picture and financial impact of every decision they're making as business needs change. And agile supply chains also have tight-knit cross-functional teams that work together and they implement new concepts and solve difficult problems in short incremental sprints. That's the definition of agility in your supply chain. And to do that, you need to have incentives for your functions to work together. Let me give you an example of this. Procurement leaders have typically been measured on cost savings. We want to look at new metrics about supplier risk management. So if you can have supplier risk management metrics for your procurement leaders and your sales team and your financial team, that allows them to be incentivized to work together and see the big picture and solve these problems. The last thing about agile teams is they continuously make smaller changes more often, get feedback, and quickly adjust based on that feedback. So those are the tips for building agile teams. Let me last talk about how do you measure your exposure to supply chain risk and help you make these decisions about resilience and agility strategies. When measuring supply chain risk, we wanna look past our traditional cost, quality, and service metrics. We now know the profitability of most companies is highly dependent upon a well-oiled supply chain. So leaders need to move beyond these traditional metrics and use key performance indicators that can measure your ability to survive and recover from a major disruption and the extent to what the financial losses are during the time of that disruption. So I'm gonna offer up two different key performance indicators some of which the data you already have today, and some you might need to dig into a little bit deeper. So let's talk about these. The first I have to offer is time to survive. This metric measures how long a company can continue matching demand if a facility was to experience a supply chain disruption. So this is data you already have. It's your inventory and your sales forecast but you want to look at it now in the context of supply chain risk management. You can really understand how much inventory you need at each distribution center or at your manufacturing location or at your storefront in order to survive an exposure to a supply chain disruption. The second one here is time to recovery. And this indicates how long it takes a facility or node in your supply chain to recover following a supply disruption. So time to recovery can be a bit more subjective because you're going to need to measure or make some estimates about those deeper levels of your supply chain, going back several tiers. So you're gonna to need to make estimates and understand this is where your supply network map that we talked about early on in the resilient strategies is really going to come into play with helping you make this estimate. In a robust and resilient supply chain, time to survive should be longer than your time to recovery. Because if time to survive is shorter than time to recovery, then companies are going to face a serious problem in the event of a disruption. Because it'll take them longer to recover 
from the disruption than they can realistically handle supplying their, their customers with their current inventory. So those are just two examples of key performance indicators that can really help you understand your exposure to risk. Now let me leave you with six tips and strategies summarizing what we've talked about of how you can build resilience and agility into your supply chain. And we're gonna start with the first one. It all starts with understanding your supply network map and looking for the vulnerabilities and points of risk or failure within that supply map. With that understanding, you can look at these other suggestions and decide where is our best cost benefit to spend time on these next strategies. So the next one is qualifying alternate sources. Thinking about having multiple source locations so that you don't have the same risks on a key component or a key raw material or a key product. And having broader geographic supply. So a domestic supplier as well as an overseas supplier. This is going to help you have a more resilient supply chain. And the last one here is inventory safety stock. Where you cannot find alternate suppliers, they're not available or they're not qualified in your, in your process. Balance the cost of disruption and what's at risk of missing those sales and that profit versus the cost to carry inventory and the risk of obsolescence. Having that bigger picture look at the financial risk is gonna help you determine what is the right inventory safety stock. Let's talk about agility. So in an agile supply chain, investing in digital technologies is going to be really important. New technologies can create an accurate digital model of your supply chain, and it can find those patterns and relationships in the thousands of data points available. Even putting in geopolitical data and your points of sale systems, your suppliers, and going back. So this is the way to make optimal decisions, is having line of sight to this data and those relationships. And then also having those agile teams that are comfortable reviewing these, these data points and responding rapidly. Innovation is another key to agility. So once you have that supply chain network mapped, brainstorm innovations that can reduce bottlenecks that you've identified. And then also reducing your product portfolio complexity. An example here of product portfolio complexity is if you manage, manufacture electronic devices, let's say, and they all use some sort of microchip. And so the technology is, is somewhat similar, but each different final product has a different size of microchip or a different housing for that chip. You have a complex portfolio because you cannot use key components in multiple different end products. So can you innovate your product design and think about using the same size or same design microchip in multiple final products, that's gonna to lead to agility in your supply chain when there is a disruption. And then lastly, creating visibility to your exposure through the right key performance indicators that balance the financial risk as well as your exposure to supply chain so that you can withstand a disruption where it matters to your bottom line. So to wrap up, I hope this gave you some great ideas on how to build resilience through supply chain network mapping, establish agility with digital enhancements and dynamic teams, and finally measure your supply chain performance with the right KPIs. Thanks for joining me today. I've really enjoyed talking about this topic that I'm really passionate about, and I hope you got some great tips today. I'm open to answer any questions that you might have. And David, do you have any questions for me? Well, first of all, thank you for just a fantastic presentation. It's very difficult to provide a presentation that is both technically sound without going into needless details, and you did that wonderfully. Yeah, thank believe you. me, I wanted to go into the details, and I've had to cut out some of the information. So again, I'm always open to answer questions or be contacted after this um, webinar, too, because I love this topic. Great. For folks at home, I want to remind you, if there were questions that were prompted for you during Jenny's presentation, feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and go ahead and put those in now because Jenny is online as we speak answering questions and it's a wonderful opportunity to interact with her. So Jenny, by way of uh, starting, uh, if you're someone who, let's say you're a product manager, uh, you, you work in a, a large organization and, and you've seen this presentation and you're like, okay, Jenny has convinced me of the need for us to increase mm -hmm. 
our resiliency. Mm -hmm. But you're concerned about conveying that message up the chain yeah. because you believe that you're going to get you know feedback like, oh, well, that's too costly. Uh, we can't do that. What are your tips to uh, kind of communicate throughout an organization to get this ball started sure. in a manufacturing yeah. type organization? No, it is a great question. And my suggestion would start with some data to support the investment of time in these resilience and agility strategies. I have some data in the presentation from McKinsey about the impact of half a year's profits can be at, at risk through a supply chain disruption. So that's a place to start with some overall data. But also a product manager is definitely gonna be able to understand what is at risk for my product line if we had a disruption of X period of time and can start to make some of those high level estimates on the back of the napkin and really then go to your leadership and say, this is the dollar amount of financial exposure that we have. And here are some resilience and agility strategies that we might want to invest in. And that is going to help you get through that first step of kind of approving for resources on a project like this. Yeah, that makes sense. So this has always been a question of mine with supply chain management. And that is, uh, how do people in the industry look at the demand side of the equation, right? Like if there's anything that stood out to me, especially like in the TikTok world, mm -hmm. is how something can go viral mm -hmm. and demand can spike. So so what do supply chain managers need to, to consider or think about on that demand yeah. side? Yeah, and I, and I would say historically and traditionally, we have looked at our past year's sales data and built a forecast based off a little growth rate or a little, you know, a little bit of, of flattening based on what we think the market conditions are. That traditional single focus look doesn't work anymore. And so demand forecasting needs to have this scenario approach where you're looking at multiple different ways that this can go. And it's truly, it's a volatile and uncertain situation. And that's where the advanced technologies of machine learning and artificial intelligence can really help kind of predict those risks and opportunities before we, in our traditional look at data, tend to see it. And so where I think demand forecasting needs to go is into this deeper data analytics um, and these advanced technologies. Yeah, interesting. When when I looked at your bio, you have done a lot of different things, uh, all in, uh, uh, in in one major company. Uh, if you were going to give advice to younger professionals mm -hmm. who maybe feel a little pigeonholed in a particular role or a particular a particular line, uh, you you mentioned throughout the presentation the need for kind of cross disciplinary mm -hmm. thinking. How does someone go about getting that cross disciplinarity yeah. if they feel like they're they're kind of pegged in an yeah. organization? Yeah, it's a great question. And I really have had a great experience in my career to be exposed to many different levels. Um, I would say the first thing for young professionals is it's amazing the direction that the, the world is going today mm -hmm. is that almost everybody is going to get exposure to multiple areas because we are not staying in these functional areas with boundaries anymore. Big company, small company, or entrepreneur. You really do get exposure to more um, these days. However, if you do feel pigeonholed or wanting to learn, what's the next thing out there? What's, how can I go forward or go back um, and learn a little bit more? My suggestion and what worked for me really well in my career is seek within your company, inside your company or outside your company in your network and find people that do something in a different area than you, a different discipline that you're interested in. Everybody is willing to help everyone, especially a young professional that's really passionate about the area that you, your job is in or that you have experience in. And I, so I would I would recommend to that young professional to be, take the initiative, go out and find that information because Again, with this interdisciplinary look at teams, when you show interest, a lot of times your leaders are going to give you the opportunity to learn by doing. Yeah, that's great leadership advice and just career development advice. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, so let's imagine uh, somebody's in an organization, they've seen this webinar, they realize we've got a big 
supply chain re resiliency mm -hmm. problem. If you had a magic wand that could immediately give them their first step for them, mm -hmm. what is the first step? What is the one thing, like like how do they get started and really make an impact yeah. in their org? Yeah, and I would say the, the first step is to look to see if your company has any contingency plans already. A lot of times because the market's been good and the market's been changing so much, Companies have not had risk mitigation or contingency plans, and that's a great place to start. If your company does have them, is it time to update them? And really starting to look at mapping the supply chain network like I talked about in the strategies, because that's where you're going to identify your vulnerabilities and really get started on it. So that's where I would start um, is looking at what your company has done in the past and then taking some of the knowledge that you might have gained today and say, where do we need to go next? And using that to start investing some time in it. Ah, good advice. Hey, thanks for answering those questions, Jenny. That was really helpful. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be here today. This is a relevant topic in today's world, so I was happy to talk about it. And thanks for those of you at home for being with us today. If you found this episode useful, please check out our executive education website. There you can find dozens of other webinars that can enhance your own learning and development. And while on the website, check out our upcoming classes. One often overlooked opportunity in exec ed is our custom programming. Custom simply means your organization shares a challenge or problem, and we work with our outstanding faculty, like Jenny, to build a solution tailored for your particular context. This is advantageous because it saves your people time and enables us to speak to your very specific situation. If you are interested in this sort of offering, please contact us in ExecEd. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you gain new insight that will accelerate your impact in your community, your organization, and the world. From the University of Denver, Daniels College of Business Executive Education Program, we look forward to seeing you again on another Accelerate webinar.